as a congregation for singing beautifully to the glory of God. Thank you. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn back to that psalm that we read just a few moments ago, Psalm 107, a psalm divided into five different sections, as we mentioned just a moment ago, each of which begins with a thanksgiving or a, a petition that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. So oftentimes we tend to complain because we think God hasn't done something that he should have done. And yet as we look at least at some of the early presidential proclamations and as we look at the Mayflower Compact, as we look at different state proclamations, and there have been many state proclamations of thanksgiving prior to the establishment of a national day of thanksgiving, there have been many calls to prayer and thanksgiving by Congress. There have actually been many calls by Congress in the past to days of fasting and humiliation because of our national sin. It reminds us of exactly what has been going on as David writes Psalm 107. The goodness of God let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, that we would give thanks because his mercy endures forever. Do you say so? Look at that in that second verse. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In many of those early proclamations, we see that they were saying so specifically in relation to verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. We find George Washington making reference to that. We find Abraham Lincoln making reference to that. We find others during different wars in the history of our country making reference to that of our presidents. If you are redeemed of the Lord, you will say so. If you are redeemed of the Lord, you will give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. If you are redeemed of the Lord, you will declare that his mercy endures forever and that everything that he does is good. That 
is the declaration of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. For those who do not trust in Jesus Christ, they look at the land and the world and all that's happening around us and they curse God. Only will they tip their hats to him if everything is going well. But for us as believers, as we have just sung and as we prayed a moment ago, even in the times of affliction, even in the times of distress, God is being good to make sure that the heart of his people is turned back to him. When a nation forgets God, it, like all the wicked, will be turned into hell. We're told that in the Psalms as well. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. People, we are looking at a nation that now is on the brink of destruction. For it is a nation that has forgotten God. Not merely a convenient, sort of out there deistic God, but it's forgotten the God of creation. It's forgotten the God of the Bible. God is long-suffering. God is gentle. God is patient. God is kind. God is good. But God is also righteous. And the wicked will he judge. But what gives me hope as I look at Psalm 107 is that in each case where we see the wicked turning their backs on God, God allows oppression to come on them, war to come on them, sickness to come on them, terrible trouble to come on them, and fear such as the mariners who are facing the magnificent waves that he creates. But in each of those cases, it is so that they will turn back to him. God's goodness sometimes brings to us the distresses through which we go so that we might have no other place to turn. No other foundation upon which we can place our feet. For he designs to draw us back to himself and away from the world. Oh, that we would think in terms of eternity about everything on earth. How different would be our perspective if we would always focus on Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about being so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I'm talking about living in this world in a way that brings glory to God and is unashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Doing everything for the glory of God. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Three times in the New Testament we are, we are exhorted with that phrase. Scripture encourages us to give thanks for the providential goodness of God. Give thanks to the Lord for his good, his mercy endures forever. The tradition thanksgiving is a time to focus on God and on his blessings dates back more than 400 years in America. We see that even before the pilgrims offered thanksgiving, there was another group that offered thanksgiving. And we as children of the Reformation remember 1564 at St. Augustine, Florida, where the French Huguenots, the Protestants who were followers of John Calvin, colonized and gave thanks to the living God for bringing them there. 1564. Other Thanksgiving, 1607 at Cape Henry, Virginia, with the landing of the Jamestown settlers declaring Thanksgiving. 
1619 at the Berkeley Plantation in Virginia, giving thanksgiving. As we look back over the history of the United States, we focus, of course, on 1621. We remember that in a very particular way. But there were others who were Bible-believing Christians who came to the shores of this country and gave thanks to the living God because of his providence and goodness in bringing them to this place. The pilgrims who, whom we remember on our Thanksgiving Day, going back to 1621, were part of an independent church, a separatist church that had separated from the Church of England and met secretly in a town called Scrooby. King James I had demanded that groups like them must conform to the official church or he would, quote, harry them out of the land. The pilgrims left England and reestablished their church in Holland, but after their young people began to be lured away by the wickedness that was there, their pastor, whose name was John Robinson, prayerfully led the church to consider relocating their entire church to the new world in America. They had several setbacks. And the first group of church members joined with a group of adventurers and set sail for America on September 6th, 1620, on the Mayflower. For two months, they braved the harsh elements and the storm-tossed sea. They got driven off course. They were headed for Virginia, but they missed it, and landed at Cape Cod in what is now called Massachusetts. Before they got off the boat, as we have read just a few moments ago, they drafted and signed the Mayflower Compact. Remember how it begins. In the name of God. And they gave their reasons for coming. For the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. There we have a document that declares for us clearly the purpose of Bible-believing Christians in celebrating a thanksgiving. William Bradford described the pilgrims' thankfulness when they disembarked. He wrote, Being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell on their knees and blessed ye God of heaven who had brought them over ye vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all ye perils and miseries thereof again to set their feet on ye firm and stable earth, their proper element. It wasn't declared a day of thanksgiving. It was thanksgiving as they fell to their knees on the earth, they gave thanks to the God of heaven who had brought them through their perils, even as we've read here in Psalm 107. Yes, they were a thankful people. Oh, dear ones, are we a thankful people? Are we a thankful people? They went through that first winter and over half of them died. What is there to be thankful in this? And yet the very next fall, they declared thanksgiving and set aside a day to give God gratitude for all the bountiful harvest that he had given them and for sending to them someone who would help them know the land. When the spring came, they were out of food after that first winter. And in March of that year, an Indian by the name of Somerset surprised the pilgrims by greeting them in English. Rather interesting how God in his sovereignty goes before us. God in his grace prepares the way. Here is an Indian who had learned English from traders who had been on fishing expeditions. He was somebody who was bright and gifted with languages, gifts that God had given to him with the interest to learn the English language. And God had prepared him for the pilgrims. A week later, Somerset returned with Squanto a former captive of English slave traders. Think about that. Someone who had much to hate 
in the English. And yet we discover something very interesting about Squanto. The English slave traders had taken him to Spain. He was rescued there by a monk and taught the Bible. Squanto eventually made his way to England and then back to America in 1619, a year before the pilgrims arrived. Now you say it's not very nice to be taken as a slave, and indeed that is the case. You would not want to be a slave, nor would I. But God in his sovereignty had something else for Squanto. During the time that he was away, something had happened to his village. When he returned to his native village, he found that everyone had been wiped out by a plague, no doubt brought to them by English traders. He was one of the last Patuxent Indians in America. Taken as a slave, comes back, finds out his village is wiped out probably by some plague brought by Englishmen. A man who had every reason to be hateful, every reason to be bitter, and now he has his chance for revenge, but instead, Squanto came and offered them his services. You see, he was a man who trusted Christ. How different we respond when we know the God of the Bible. How differently we interact with others whom we have reason to hate when we know that our sins have been forgiven. Squanto taught the pilgrims how to fish for cod, how to plant corn with a fish, how to stalk deer, how to plant pumpkins, skin beavers, what berries were edible and which berries were not edible. And so here was this American Indian who understood English fluently. He understood the English customs and ways. He ate English food. And he was committed to the same Christ as the pilgrims. He was the right man at the right place in the right time, and only God in his sovereignty can do that. You know, I think Squatter was a great deal like Joseph in Egypt. Joseph was sold into slavery. Joseph experienced years of hardship. But Joseph was brought back together with his brothers because Joseph had been through that experience with the God of the Bible. He was shaped and molded through suffering to be an instrument of God, literally to keep the people of God alive. Governor Bradford described Squanto, quote, as a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. Squanto not only taught the pilgrims much about how to live in the new world, and he and Somerset helped forge a long-lasting peace treaty between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag Indians. But in the fall of 1621, as the pilgrims gathered for a bountiful harvest, Pilgrim Edward Winslow expressed their thanksgiving. God be praised. We had a good increase of corn by the goodness of God. We are far from want. They invited their Indian friends for a Thanksgiving celebration. And Edward Winslow also records, quote, our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, that is turkey hunting, so that we might have a special manner to rejoice together after we had gathered the fruits of our labors. So the pilgrims declared a three-day feast. It wasn't in November, it was in December of 1621, to thank God and to celebrate with these new-made friends in America. Ninety Wampanoag Indians joined the 50 pilgrims for three days of feasting. It included all kinds of good things, shellfish and lobsters and turkey and cornbread and berries and deer and many other foods. There was play and activity and enjoyment of one another. The pilgrims, young men and the Wampanoag young men engaged in races, wrestling matches and athletic events. But most of all, it was a day of prayer. A day of prayer. As was their custom, Elder William Brewster, for he's not merely governor then, he was elder. William Brewster would have led them in a prayer of thanksgiving to God for his goodness. 
This celebration and its accompanying activities were the origin of what we now celebrate in November. We've already spoken of how the Massachusetts Bay Colony followed the example and their town councils declared days of prayer and fasting as well as days of thanksgiving. The in New England colonies typically called for a day of prayer and fasting in the spring and a day of prayer and thanksgiving in the fall. Although thanksgiving celebrations were common throughout New England, they did not begin to spread southward until the War for Independence when the Continental Congress issued this is Congress issuing these. The Continental Congress, during the Revolutionary War, the War of Independence, issued eight proclamations for a day of thanksgiving and prayer. We also need to remember that Congress also issued seven proclamations for a day of fasting and prayer. Can you imagine our modern Congress not just going with the tradition of the November Thanksgiving, because that's tradition. Can you imagine our Congress issuing a proclamation calling for a day of fasting and prayer? Oh, dear people, I suspect that many of them might be voted out of office the very next time around. Fasting? We, the American gluttons? You calling upon us to fast? You see, fasting is connected in Scripture to repentance. Fasting is connected in Scripture to great need and dire distress. And we don't see ourselves as a nation that needs to repent. We don't see ourselves as a nation whereby fasting and confession of sin is necessary. During the American Revolution, we had 15 official prayer proclamations calling either for thanksgiving or for fasting. For example, following the amazing victory at Saratoga, a congressional committee consisting of two signers of the Declaration of Independence, Richard Henry Lee and Samuel Adams, along with General Daniel Rabideau, recommended the following resolution on November 1st, 1777. For as much as it is the indispensable duty of all men to adore the superintending providence of Almighty God, to acknowledge with gratitude their obligation to him for benefits received and to implore such further blessing as they stand in need of. And it having pleased him in his abundant mercy, not only to continue to us the innumerable bounties of his common providence, it is therefore recommended to the legislature or executive powers of these United States to set apart Thursday the 18th day of December next for the solemn thanksgiving and praise, that with one heart and with one voice the good people may express the grateful feelings of their hearts and consecrate themselves to the service of their divine benefactor, and that together with their sincere acknowledgments and offerings they may join the penitent confession of their manifold sins, whereby they had forfeited every favor, and their humble and earnest supplication, that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ mercifully to forgive and blot them out of remembrance, that it may please him to prosper the trade and manufactures of these people and the labor of the husbandmen, that our land may yet yield its increase for the enlargement and the promotion of that kingdom which consists in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Congress past that. America's first national Thanksgiving proclamation of the U.S. Constitution, we've read it a few moments ago, was by George Washington in 1789. On the day after the framers of the Bill of Rights voted to approve them, the Congressional reads for September 25th as follows. Mr. Elias Boudinot said that he could not think of letting the session pass without offering an opportunity to all citizens of the United States of joining with one voice in returning to Almighty God their sincere thanks for the many blessings he had poured down upon them. With this view, therefore, he would move the following resolution. Resolved that a joint committee of both houses be directed to wait upon the President of the United States to request that he would recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer. Mr. Roger Sherman justified the practice of thanksgiving on any single event, not only as a laudable one in itself, but also as warranted by a number of precedents 
in holy writ. For instance, the solemn thanksgiving and rejoicing which took place in the time of Solomon after the building of the temple was a case in point. This example he thought worthy of a Christian imitation on the present occasion." Unquote. My, how different the discussions in Congress were as this fledgling nation began to take flight in the power and in the providence of Almighty God. How different from today. As Washington himself said, it is the duty of all nations. It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and to humbly implore his protection and favor. Following that initial proclamation, National Thanksgiving proclamations approved by Congress and issued by the President only occurred sporadically thereafter. Most Thanksgiving observances were either proclaimed by civil authorities at the state level or at the local level. By 1820, the various state governments had issued, now listen to this. Can you imagine state governments? How many proclamations do you think they offered? 50? 100? Maybe 150? The official proclamations by state governments by 1820 that's a long time ago, people. We're almost coming up to 200 years on that. Nine more years. We're 200 years at that point. Up to 1820, state governments had issued at least 1,400 official prayer proclamations, almost half for times of thanksgiving and prayer and the other half for fasting and prayer. Can you imagine that? State governments issuing proclamations for fasting and prayer, as well as for thanksgiving. The thanksgiving proclamation issued by Lincoln was remarkable not only for its strong religious content, we just heard it, but for its timing as I intimated a moment ago. It was issued during some of the darkest days of the Civil War when the Union having lost more battles than they had won and the outcome of the war was still very much uncertain. Yet Lincoln called the American people to adopt the attitude of gratitude. That remarkable Thanksgiving proclamation came after a pivotal point in President Lincoln's spiritual walk, which was three months after the Battle of Gettysburg resulting in the loss of some 60,000 American lives. While Lincoln was walking among the thousands of graves there at Gettysburg, he reportedly committed his life to Christ. As he later explained to an Illinois clergyman, quote, When I left Springfield, Illinois, to assume the presidency, I asked the people to pray for me. I was not a Christian. When I buried my son, the severest trial of my life, I was not a Christian. But when I went to Gettysburg and saw the graves of thousands of our soldiers, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ. The dramatic impact from that experience can be felt not only in Lincoln's Thanksgiving Day proclamation, but also in his second inaugural address in 1865, which reads more like a biblical sermon than like a political speech. What a change. What a change. When a man trusts Christ. Dear people, are you praying for our leaders? Are you praying for our leaders? What a change it would be. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Must God bring us, as David describes in this psalm, must God bring us to the point of utter despair before we turn to Him and give Him thanksgiving 
and praise. Yes. Going back to the pilgrims one more time. The pilgrims planted their crops in the spring of 1623, anticipating another bountiful harvest. Well, this was after the Thanksgiving that they had celebrated. So the spring now of 1623, another whole year has gone by. And they anticipate God's blessing. It's a very dangerous thing to fall into. Whereby we begin to take the goodness of God for granted. But the summer, that summer, was a horrible summer. That summer brought a severe drought, and I quote, which continued from ye three week in May till about ye middle of July without any rain and without and with great heat for ye most part insomuch as ye corn began to wither away. You see, we can often take God's goodness for granted. They went from May through the middle of July with no rain. All the spring crops that had sprung up begin to wither in the heat. It's almost like approaching another winter as they had had that first year where half of them died. With no rain in sight and their crops dying, Governor William Bradford, quote, set apart a solemn day of humiliation to seek ye Lord by humble and fervent prayer in this great distress. Unquote. How thankful we are for the journals of William Bradford, which tells us not merely a history, but it tells us the spiritual walk of God's people and how they responded in the times of blessing and distress. Everyone gathered in the meeting house early and spent that clear, hot day in repentance and prayer. When they opened the doors of the meeting house that evening, the skies were cloudy, and then it began to rain, a gentle, soaking rain, on and off for the next two weeks, which gave them cause for, quote, rejoicing and blessing God, as Governor Bradford explained, and I quote, it came without either wind or thunder or any violence, and by degrees in abundance, as that ye earth was thoroughly wet and soaked therewith, which did so apparently revive and quicken ye decayed corn and other fruits, as was wonderful to see, and made ye Indians astonished to behold. And afterward, the Lord sent them such seasonable showers with interchangeable of fair weather as through his blessing caused a fruitful and liberal harvest through their no small comfort and rejoicing. Unquote. Dear people, oh, that we might regain the spiritual roots of our country. God brings his people through the times of distress when their hearts are not right with him to turn them back to him that's the whole purpose of Psalm 107 that's the whole reason that David writes in the last two verses the righteous shall see it and rejoice and all iniquity shall stop her mouth whoso is wise and will observe these things even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. As you celebrate Thanksgiving today, don't forget to take time to genuinely and sincerely thank God for His many blessings. Not merely His material blessings, oh, how easy it will be, get, be to be caught up in the turkey and the ham and the duck and chicken and whatever else you're going to eat and many, many things. And God has provided us richly all things to enjoy. But don't forget, as you partake of that feast, to give thanks to the one from whose bountiful hand it has come.
spirit of thanksgiving. It's a unique holiday for those of us in the United States. And it goes back to the spiritual roots of those who believed the word of God and who had hearts that were truly thankful. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we do thank you, the true and living God. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. And Father, we come before you today to praise you and to thank you for your goodness. You are the Lord. Your mercies endure forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, Lord, we say so. You are good. And to you we give thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen.